want us to open our Bibles to Luke chapter 24 this morning. Luke chapter 24. It's a lengthy text, but it's sort of a story that happened the day of resurrection. This is often told as the Emmaus Road incident. I entitled the message today, The Things That Happened. The Things That Happened. Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. Now behold, two of them, and them are disciples, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they walked and talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, this is the resurrected Jesus, and he draws near to them, and he begins to walk with them. Now, verse 16 is important. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now, I've always thought that was interesting. Jesus joins alongside of them, but God restrains their eyes from recognizing Jesus. There's a purpose for it. But it is important that we understand how their eyes were restrained. Verse 17, Jesus said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are so sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? So they began to tell him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose up that very hour. They returned to Jerusalem. Remember, they're seven, hour, uh, seven miles from Jerusalem. They returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Let's bow together. Father... Speak to us through these words. Speak to us through this time. Thank you for the message that we've enjoyed and shared in music, how it's lifted our souls, how we know, God, that you came and you died in our place. Lord, you are the one that we worship, and for that we just say hallelujah. Now, Lord, Help us to see through the eyes of the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Help us to understand a little bit of what they were going through. And Lord, may we find that same wonder. May our hearts burn within us as your word is proclaimed this hour. 
I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the word he is risen, or the words he is risen, remind us of the news of Easter. Jesus did not die in vain. Folks, you cannot separate Resurrection Sunday from the crucifixion. You cannot separate the death of Christ and the burial of Christ from the resurrection. There must be all three. It isn't enough that Jesus was on a cross. Jesus had to die. But he also had to be buried, which was an evidence of death. And he had to stay buried for the three days because that had been prophesied. But he also had to rise again. The resurrection had to happen. And when we say the words, he is risen, as we did in the end, what we are doing is we're sharing this beautiful, wonderful, incredible, awesome truth with one another. And it gives us hope. The resurrection gives us hope that this world is, this is not it. There's more to it. The resurrection gives us hope. I had someone came to me this morning after the sunrise service, and they said, and I asked them how they were doing. They had lost a loved one recently, and they said, Easter Sunday, today, this gives me hope, and it does. It gives hope to everyone who has ever said goodbye to someone, everyone who has ever stood around a, a, a place where a coffin is lowered into the ground. This day gives us hope because all of what Christ said has come to pass. And all that he has promised will come to pass. It will occur just as he has said. This is what it means to say he is risen. For the life of me, I wonder why folks would want to deny the resurrection. Sometimes, and I shared again this morning, that, that the idea of someone that you knew and that you saw and that you witnessed uh, uh, was beaten and suffered and humiliated and you saw him die, if, if you woke up the next day, your heart would be heavy. And it would be hard to believe what you had seen has been reversed. What you saw is now uh, 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 just the beginning of what has now occurred, resurrection. So it is. It's fantastic, and it's incredible, and it is hard to believe. No doubt about it. But if we do believe it, and we believe that Jesus Christ rose again, then the resurrection makes us do something else. It forces us to realize that we're going to see this man again. We're going to kneel before him. We are going to recognize that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And so I think a lot of times we want to deny the resurrection so this may not occur. Paul said that if there is no resurrection, the preaching of Christ, all the teachings, all the things, it would become senseless and meaningless. The faith that we espouse in Christ, it becomes useless because he's dead. There's no living Savior that we can have faith in. All the witnesses and all the preachers and all the ones who, who stated as fact the resurrection, it's recorded, it's written, all of them are liars if Jesus is not raised. If Jesus has not been resurrected, not a single person on this earth would be redeemed from their sin, which means saved. The price and the penalty of our sin would still rest upon us, and then we'd have to figure out some way to pay for it, which we cannot. All former believers who have died, if there is no resurrection, they were all fools. And they died as fools believing something that is not true. And Paul said that if Jesus Christ is not risen, Christians are the most pitiable people on this planet because we've been deluded. See, all this would be true if Jesus did not rise from the dead. But he did. But he did. I think we deny Jesus and deny the resurrection for this simple fact. We want to deny Jesus Christ as the Lord of all. And we want to deny the fact that one day we will give an account before him as the righteous judge whom God has granted the authority to have judgment. We also want to deny the sinfulness of sin. We want to deny the death that comes because of sin. We want to deny that he's ever going to come again. We want to deny the gospel message and the beautiful grace of Christ. But it is a message to repent and believe. And it is a message that we would like to deny. 
People would like to deny that there's a coming judgment. People would like to deny that there's a literal hell. People would like to deny that there's no such thing as the lake of fire that's mentioned in Revelation. And all these last things are terrible things, but they're not terrible for the believer who knows Christ and has no fear whatsoever of all of this. But if we deny Christ and if we deny the resurrection, all of this will become reality one day. Jesus has died and he's been buried and a few days have passed. These disciples that are going to Jerusalem, I just kind of, I just kind of wonder what's going through their heart as they're traveling down the road. I, can't, I, think I, have, I think I can imagine a few things. I think every day since Jesus cried out, it is finished, since his body was taken down and wrapped in linen and placed in, in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, I think from that point on is a nightmare for everyone who believed in him. They had everything they had staked on Jesus. He was going to be the Messiah. Now, now they said, if you, if you listen carefully to the words, they said, we believe that he was a great prophet and the words and the things that he did in his works, what they were saying is, he was different. It was obvious that God was, was with him. He taught with authority. The miracles that he did, we couldn't deny. Did you notice they didn't go far enough to acknowledge him as Messiah? Why? Because he died. He died. The Messiah wasn't supposed to die in their mind. Messiah was supposed to come in, and when he, when he entered in Jerusalem and all the palm leaves were thrown down and everybody said, Hosanna, and, and they cried out, what he was supposed to do was come in and just rest control from the Romans, give Israel their independence, let them be the royal nation that they were supposed to be. Their whole mind was that another king was coming that was going to release them from the oppression of Rome. And instead, Rome killed their king and hung him beaten and naked and bleeding before the people, disowned by his own. I noticed that the disciples on the Emmaus Road left something out in their story. They said the Jewish leaders, they turned Jesus over to the Roman authorities and they wanted him crucified. But you remember what the story really was? And I'm not saying they lied because they were for Christ. It was certainly a gas to them that Jesus was ever crucified. These are people who love Jesus. But what happened was the Jewish leaders brought the trumped up charges against him and in a kangaroo court, the leaders of Rome found no wrong that he had done, and they gave the people an option. Let us give you an insurrectionist, a criminal. Let us, let us, let us give you that or him. Which one do you want? They just thought, well, certainly common sense, would they would choose the, the most despicable person, not the one that had done nothing wrong. And what happened? God's own people cried out, crucify him. He wasn't just disowned by the Jewish leadership. They loathed him and hated him. His own people, his own people cried out, crucify him. So these are the things that happened, and this is what's happening on this road. These men have, woke, have, have awakened each morning to this nightmare. He's gone. He's gone. He's not coming back. They forgot that he said, I'm going to be handed over to the authorities. They're going, to cruise, they're going to kill me, and three days later I'm going to rise from the dead. They forgot that somehow in all their grief. When we look at the uh, case of Mary Magdalene, which is above this in the scriptures, the text, she goes after she sees Jesus and he, she, he reveals himself to her and she sees him alive and she goes to tell the others they won't believe her. And then these two that are now with Jesus, they're not going to believe them. And the reason is, is it's just too much to believe. <laughs> this is all that's going on. They're all living the same nightmare. Every hope they had hinged on Jesus being the Messiah. They just never saw him being the sacrifice. So Jesus pulls up alongside of them and starts walking with them. 
Now, folks, I don't know if it's my dark humor that just rides with me everywhere I go, but I find humor in this. I do. I do. Let me tell you why I do. Jesus knows that he's fixing to turn their world inside out. <laughs> their life, can you imagine that their lives were never the same? I'm telling you, their lives are fixing to change like they can't imagine. They're fixing to see something that is unimaginable. And God, just for that moment, doesn't allow them to recognize Christ. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot we can say about the resurrection body. There's a lot that we can say about the appearance of the resurrection body. But in this moment, they're not allowed to know it's Jesus. So he walks up beside them, and he begins to question them, what, what things are, are y'all talking about? And they're, they said, man, what rock have you been under? Have you not heard what's been going on? I mean, everything is news to them. They can't believe that somebody doesn't know all that's happened. So this tells me that it's, it's talk around town. It, it, is, it is the headlines. And they begin to tell Jesus all the things. He says, what things? And so they begin to tell him. And basically, they tell him about the rejection of the leadership, the betrayal of the leadership, that Jesus had been condemned, that Jesus uh, had been crucified. They sort of revealed a little bit of a misplaced hope, not a misplaced hope in, the, they had hope in the right person. They just didn't have hope in the way that this person was to provide the hope. They didn't get that. But they said, we had hoped he'd been Messiah. Well, he was Messiah, brother, sister. He was Messiah completely. He had revealed it. Uh, uh, when, when Peter proclaimed that he was a son of the living God and Jesus made a mention that God is the one that showed you this, you didn't figure this out on your own. All of this had been revealed. Jesus absolutely revealed himself as Messiah. But he died. He died. They said, we did recognize him as a prophet, a mighty prophet, and the powerful deeds and the powerful words and all the authority he had. All of this has happened, and now here we are. We're walking. And I guess they were headed to Jerusalem. I meant they weren't heading away. They were going to Jerusalem. They were going to be there. And they said, now it's been three days. Three days. Three days. But today, today we heard something that we're really buzzing about. Some of the ladies, now we know from the gospel accounts, the ladies had gone down early that morning in one of their final acts. These ladies had followed Christ. They had ministered to him from their substance is what the Bible says. Basically, uh, they were taking care of, of their needs, feeding and, and whatever else they had to do as they traveled. And it's an, uh, Jesus literally didn't have his own bed, his own home. They just, they traveled. Mary Magdalene was the one I talked about this morning. She was one who had demons cast out from her. She was there with Jesus until the very end, standing there at the cross. And she was the very first person that was told that Jesus Christ was alive by Jesus himself. Well, these women, these women have come back and said the tomb was empty. The grave was empty, that Jesus is alive. They're amazed by it. The angels had, they, well, in uh, one account, it's a single angel. There was two. Uh, one spoke, and he told them, Jesus is not here. He is risen. So now they have something new to think about. Do you ever feel that there's a skeptical part of you that you wish you didn't have sometimes? Does anybody ever feel that way? I have that. I can be very skeptical at times. And I can just imagine the, 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 the disciples have already decided the women just don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> Eyewitness accounts, nah, I don't think so. Why? Because I saw him die. If I saw him die, then he must be dead. And so there's a part of us that kind of comes to a place where we say, okay, I'll give this up. I'll say that Jesus was a great person. He was a great humanitarian. Uh, he did good things. Not so sure about the miracles because they're kind of hard to understand. And we can go through and rationalize a lot of stuff. 
But I'm telling you where you're going to hit a dead end is when you come to a man dying and then being alive again. But see, the resurrection is what makes valid all the miracles. Everything that Jesus said and did comes to pass. Even the virgin birth of Christ, all of that comes to pass only and if only Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That hard-heartedness and unbelief that all of us may battle at times, part of our skepticism, it's just simply not willing to believe even if the evidence is right there. In Luke 24, 25, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. It's a mild rebuke. He's not pouncing on them, but he is definitely talking to them. You're so foolish, he said. Slow of heart means why do you refuse to believe what has been said of the Messiah by the prophets? What is it about that that you're having trouble believe? As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I'm going to read some of those scriptures from the prophets that Jesus shared with them. Verse 26, he said, Ought not the Christ, the Messiah, ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So these things that you told me, this forsaking of his people, this being cut off from the living, this being uh, uh, nailed to a tree, wasn't all of this prophesied to happen to the Messiah? It's all in the scriptures if you would but look at them. And it says here that beginning at Moses, the first books of, the, of our Bible, and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's these three men walking down the road, and Jesus is taking from the very beginning, I'm thinking, here's what I'm thinking, Genesis, when God declared to Adam and Eve that from the seed of woman there will come one, that is a child will be born, who Satan will bruise his heel, I think it speaks of the crucifixion, but Jesus Christ, that seed, will crush his head. I believe it's the first one. I believe even after that, when, when God made coverings, he provided skins to give coverings. Uh, there had to be a sacrifice that the skins could be given. I believe that begins. And there's a, a crimson thread that runs all through our Bible that speaks of the death of Christ, the substitutionary death of animals that our sins could be covered, all the requirements of God, the lambs, the, the doves, whatever it may be. God required the shedding of blood for the remission of sin. And we see it again and again and again and again throughout all of Scripture. All of it. So he began to expound all of these things to them. If you want to know more about God and you want to know more about Jesus and you want to know more about what the scriptures say, listen, you, you, can, you can. You can get on a, a YouTube or you can go somewhere and hear a hundred sermons. But I'm telling you, if you want to know more about, and, and that's not a bad thing either. I don't want you to think it is. But if you want to know more about God and more about Jesus and more about yourself, Read the Bible. Read the Bible. We don't read our Bibles. That's why he had to expound it to them. They are acting by sight and not by faith. Faith cometh by hearing the word. That's where we get our faith from. So Jesus goes to the source of faith, the word, and he begins to expound to them the truths concerning himself. Folks, let me ask you something. When I read this thing and he said, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, <laughs> don't we all feel a little slow at heart sometimes when it comes to just trusting God and believing the promises that he has in his word? I do. I get so frustrated myself sometimes. I know God loves me. I know God's going to watch over me. I know God's going to keep me. I can trust him. I don't know why I think that I have to pick things up and do them my way when I know and have been absolutely convinced again and again and again that God's way is best. Do you know the part that I have the hardest doing is learning to wait for his direction. I get so impatient. I want this to happen now. I want it to be. That's what they were doing in essence. They were saying we wanted him 
to be the Messiah. We had an idea of what we wanted him to do, and they forgot what the Scripture said, that the Messiah had to suffer. Now, Jesus could have said, he could have said, hey, hey, it's me. <laughs> I'm right here. Surprise. It's me. But he didn't do that. You know what he did? He took them on a journey through his word. <laughs> Folks, I cannot explain to you how precious the word of God is. We don't worship our Bibles, but we worship the God that's in that Bible. And he's on every single page revealing himself to us in a print that we can read and understand and the only book on earth that when you open, the author is there with you to help you. And that's what he did. Now they came into a town. Jesus was going to move on, but, but they convinced him to stay. They sat down. They're going to have a meal. Jesus at the table with them, verse 30. He took the bread. He took bread. And he broke it. That was just how you imparted. They didn't have knives before. They just broke the bread and they passed it off. Kurt, if you and I were eating, I'd break the bread and give you a piece and we'd have our bread and drink whatever they had on the table. That's what we'd do. That's just, that's the custom. But listen what he did. He took the bread, he blessed it. Then he broke it. And then he gave it to them. Now this makes me emotional because what I see in this is the upper room. This is what I see the new covenant that he introduces with the Lord's Supper. This is what I see when I hear these words. What does the bread stand for at the Lord's Supper table? Now at the Lord's Supper table, what does the bread represent? The body, the body, the broken body. Broken, bruised, wounded for our sins. If there couldn't, if, if folks, if there could never be a better time to reveal himself to them, wouldn't it be as he broke the bread, symbolic of the life that was broken right in front of them? Wouldn't that be the perfect time to reveal himself to them? And he did. But let me tell you what he didn't do. He didn't say, surprise, it's me. He just allowed them in that moment to see him for who he was, the Savior who bled and died and was broken and was buried and is now very much alive. Then he disappeared. <laughs> That's the humor part to me. <laughs> then he just disappeared. Some people say, I don't like that. I wouldn't like it either if I was there. Can you imagine the conversation they had the second after they realized that and then he was gone? <laughs> I wish we had that recorded. We don't. I'd love to know what they said. But i tell you what they did do. They got up and they headed on to Jerusalem. They didn't mess around. They wanted to share the good news. And the good news was we have seen him and he is alive. My prayer today as we gather to celebrate the resurrection of Christ and then as we as a people gather around the Lord's table to remember the body broken and the blood shed that we might have resurrection that Christ offered. My prayer is that God by his grace and mercy would allow all of us to see Christ as the Messiah, the Lord and our Savior. The Lord's Supper is a way that we present the Lord and it's a way that we do that in anticipation of his return. So there's more to it than just remembering the death, the broken body and the blood and the death. It's also anticipating the return where Jesus said that we will partake of this supper in heaven with him. Don't understand all that's involved in that, but I know there's anticipation because he said 
that we are giving remembrance in him even unto his return. So it's a very special time. The Lord's Supper is for people who believe in Christ. If you, if you don't believe in Christ, it really doesn't mean anything to you. So I don't know that I would partake of the supper if you're not a believer and don't believe. But let me tell you what I want to do, and I'm asking this right now before we begin this time. If the Lord is convicting you of your need for salvation, here's what I want to ask us to do for just a moment. Can we just bow our heads for just a moment? Now, I'm going to ask every Christian in here, every confessed believer in Christ who is saved, the Bible says that we pray that the God of this world, and that is Satan, that he has blinded the eyes of those lest they see the light they believe. And so in that, that hardness of heart, there's a blindness. Christian, would you pray? Would you just pray that God would just remove that blindness and that, that, that unbelievers might see the precious light of Christ and who he is? And then if you're here today and the Lord is dealing with your heart, would you be willing right where you're at right now just to ask the Lord to help you to see Christ as he is and to see yourself as you are? The Holy Spirit will bring conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit will also, the Holy Spirit will also grant you the faith to believe. He will give that work in your heart and do that work in your heart. To me, it would be a wonderful thing on Resurrection Sunday for someone that is lost to ask Christ to be their Lord and Savior and then as their first act as a new believer to come to the table and remember Jesus Christ who made it all available. So with just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity. With heads bowed, Christians pray. Father, I ask you at this moment, if there's anyone here today that came into this room today not knowing you as their Lord and Savior, maybe today, Lord, that you have convicted them, help them, Lord, to see you as you have revealed yourself. Lord, unless you draw us to you, unless you reveal Christ to us, we'd never know. So, Lord, we pray for that even now. God, give them a faith to believe Help them to look to Christ, to call upon Him, even now, to save them from their sins. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.